beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold him. Woo! Thank you, Lord God. We're going to be in Ecclesiastes chapter number 7, but if you want to get a head start on me, I'm going to be in my introduction here in a moment for 1 Kings. Uh, I'm going to use chapter number 2. We used it a little bit, and we'll be using it as we finish out our study in Ecclesiastes, considering that it has a lot to do with the main character of those first few chapters in 1 Kings. And of course, right now as we're looking at Ecclesiastes and the preacher, Solomon, and he has this gathering. He also had a gathering at another time, and we talked about that last week, that he was at the conclusion of the building of the temple in a place of preaching and praying and, and getting them all ready for this dedication of the, of the temple. And so Solomon had quite a, quite a lineage, quite, a, quite a, a good start, let's just put it that way. But as we see in Ecclesiastes in our study, he did not finish so well. Two Sundays ago, we jumped into our year, of course, and it was the first Sunday of the year. Uh, the next couple of Sundays are pretty special. Next Sunday will be a celebration of life Sunday. And so uh, uh, we'll be a little bit in, in, in our message, but it will not be tied together to Ecclesiastes. The following Sunday will be uh, missions on Sunday. So this will be, uh, there'll be a little bit of break here in Ecclesiastes study. But as I uh, launched things off the first of the year a couple Sundays ago, I let all of you know, hey, this is what's going on. Again, <clears throat> back to our preaching series in Ecclesiastes. But we looked at our Acts 2 project, our 25th anniversary how do you like the painting I did this week? I had a little time off and pretty good. I do I do pretty good. Bobby came in and, and Dwayne and we just had like a little pastor's getaway and we did some painting. What do you think? We do a pretty good job? Yeah, right. <laughs> the guys did a great job and we're very, very thankful. How do you like it? Amen? Is it good? Looks beautiful. Carpet will be in here in the in the end of February. Uh, there's a lot of things that are going on as we get into our regular season very shortly. But this is a, a time of really training ground, the first part of the year, setting out things for the whole year. And again, in our study, it helps a little bit, uh, putting out a few things about regional missions and all that ties together. But really, this is our 25th anniversary celebration, God's favor, 25 years. And I want you to be in on everything that's going on. And and sometimes you say, oh, I didn't know, or I didn't read the screen, or I missed the email, or something, or, or, or a text that's been sent out, or things. So we use still paper products around here. And I don't mean to go potty now. Come on now. So I'm not, not just thinking for our handouts. Our ushers behind you have some handouts. And if you do not have one, would you raise your hand, and they will pass one to you. There's a few people that do not have one. And if you raise your hand, keep your hand up, they will get one to you. Um, anybody else? There's one over here that is right behind you. Anybody else? A few people right there. There's a few more. There you go. Come on, Connor. I, you told me you're in good shape. There you go. Now you got three or four. We're just passing out five at a time. That's all right. But now you know what's going on. So back to Ecclesiastes, we're in chapter number 7 here in a little bit. I'm going to use 1 Kings 2 as a little bit of an introduction. That's why I, I sent you there, because this guy Solomon, we have to be reminded of where he's at here each and every week, I think. He's kind of like us. He started out really well, as I mentioned earlier, but boy, he had some tough times. And his tough times pointed, of course, to his broken relationship with God. They pointed to a man that started out, again, once really, really well, close to God. He's God's anointed man. He is the king. He has been given favor by God. He has been anointed by God. But again, by the time we find Ecclesiastes, we see that his relationship with God is distant. We see that his relationship with God really is, as it says in the verse up there, in a place where he's still seeking, he's searching out by wisdom, Concerning all things that are done under heaven. Remember, remember, this is our theme verse. Search for purpose in everything. And when you think again about this theme verse in verse number 13 in chapter 1, you're going, hey, that's a good thing. 
to seek and to search out by wisdom concerning all things. Yes, we're to search for purpose in everything. But it says under heaven. It says under the sun, which can lead to a place of futility and vexation of spirit and vanity because he's leaving out the one above the sun, which is holy God. The second half of the verse says, this sore travail hath God given to the sons of man to be exercised therewith. You might think, oh, well, gosh, he's blaming God. Good. (laughs) Blame God. Not blame God, though, really in the negative sense, but charge God with this particular task, with this particular opportunity for all of us every day. That as Solomon is stating, to seek and to search out by wisdom all that's under the sun, if you really seek and search out above the sun, you seek and search out God himself, You'll be different than where Solomon landed in Ecclesiastes. You'll be like the Solomon that is in 1 Kings chapter number 1 and chapter number 2. You see, Solomon was good. Solomon did a lot of good. But Solomon missed the right. So this morning in chapter number 7 when we get there, we're going to entitle our message, Right is Better Than Good. You've heard me say that phrase before where, you know, sometimes... Hey, I'm going to pick a good thing to do, but it may not be the right. See, the right thing is always good, but the good thing's not always right, and I have mentioned that before. Just like last week, we looked at life doesn't always make sense. We see that life sometimes appears to be good and okay, but in God's sense is when it really makes sense, because God's sense always makes sense, my man's sense, my Good common sense doesn't always take me through. A few weeks ago, back in December, I preached on chapter number five, good things can become bad. And we talked about all these good things. And there's a lot of good things. There's the mention in Proverbs by Solomon of saying, a good man obtaineth favor of the Lord, but a man of wicked devices will he condemn. That's Proverbs 12, 2. It says in Proverbs 12, 14, A man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. And the recompense of a man's hands shall be rendered unto him. It says in Proverbs 13, 22, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. I read many of these verses (coughs) when I talked about this good sometimes can become bad. Good things can become bad. But when it comes to right things, Solomon wrote this, Proverbs 4.11. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in right paths. He's speaking to his son. This is the man who wrote Ecclesiastes in a place where his life is barely good. And he's lost the right, the right path. It says in Proverbs 8.6, hear, for I will speak of excellent things. This is Solomon. And the opening of my lips shall be right things, right paths, right things. It says in Proverbs 23, 16, Yea, my reins shall rejoice when thy lips speak right things. Right, doing what's right, being in a place of right is always better than good. Remember all the good things, but remember what makes you right. It says in Romans 5, verse 18 and 19, Therefore, as by the offense of one, judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift upon all men unto justification of life. You want to know how to be made right? It's by Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. Believers, you know, you're right in Jesus. Not right in you. You may be a good person. There's a lot of good people that are lost and are going to go to hell. It says in Romans 5.19, as I said, I I read 5.18, but 5.19 says, For as by one man's offense, many were made sinners. You, me, everybody. By one man's offense, Adam. 
By one man, sin came into the world and death by sin. Oh, Adam. Well, you and I are Adams. But the second half of verse, five, uh, verse 19 of chapter 5 says, So by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. Hallelujah for that. Putting your faith and trust in him. For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, to get to God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. <clears throat> Solomon's at the end of his life writing Ecclesiastes. And he's settled on good. He's almost like any other lost person blowing like a kite in the wind. Not knowing direction. Not knowing where to go wandering all over the place when this was God's man anointed to be king. Good is all right. In fact, being called a good guy is okay. He's a good guy. She's a good person. They're all good people. I've joked about this maybe from the pulpit. I don't know. We used to have this thing in chapel when we would talk to other chapel leaders and different guys and uh, major league chapel leaders. They would uh, Guys would be coming into a uh, into uh, the, um, Kansas City, maybe from the Detroit Tigers or the Angels, whoever, and hey, who, who are the chapel guys on the team? So we call them the chapel guys. And then, of course, hey, what kind of guy is he, Dwayne? Ah, he's a good guy. Oh, he's a good guy. Oh, he's a good guy. And he's, everybody's a good guy. Everybody's a good guy. Everybody who goes to chapel is a good guy. Sometimes... I wonder if that's the way we're looked at. They're the good people that go to church. Here you go. What would you rather hear said about you? That you choose to do what is good or do what is right? Oh, now here we go. I'm not talking about your self-righteousness where you jut out your chest and say you're better than anyone. I'm talking about walking in the humility of Jesus Christ and doing what's right, choosing what's right. That's better than just choosing what's good. Good is good, yes. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, yes, yes, we know. And, but, but remember, good things can become bad. But when you and I are sitting in the right of Jesus... The righteous of Jesus, the righteousness of Jesus, then we're reminded of what it says in the Bible. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. They don't mean anything. All the good stuff, the righteousnesses, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. I can't do any of that. So today in that kind of, a, kind of a foundation, I want you to question yourself in this area. Question, let's, let's just question ourselves together. Is it unfortunate that the world characterizes us only as a good person? Just as many people who are lost. There's a lot of good people I know that are not saved. They don't have the righteousness of Jesus Christ because they've never called on the name of the Lord. It's not that their color's wrong or their talk is wrong or their way of life is wrong. The gospel's for everyone to be made right in Jesus Christ is everyone's opportunity. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish. He wants us to be made right, like he wanted Solomon to live his life right. In 1 Kings chapter number 2, I want you to just to see these first three or four verses. I'll read them as part of our intro, and then I'll go into Ecclesiastes and have our little morning devotion together. But I want you to see verse number 1, chapter number 2, 1 Kings, it's on page 472 in your Bible. Here we go. Now the days of David drew nigh that he should die. And he charged Solomon his son, saying, I go the way of all the earth, 
Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. If it all ended right there, nope, he's got more to say. Watch this. Here's the charge. Verse 3, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God. Remember we had an introduction about Solomon many, many weeks ago? Keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, to, and his commandments, and his judgment, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, whithersoever thou turnest thyself. Now just sit on verse 3. Just sit there for a minute. There's none of that, none of that that is a good deal, good life. I'm a good person. This is the righteousness of God put upon him to live that way. It has to be. You really think that you can follow all that God's laid out for you without the Lord Jesus Christ? The Bible says you're wrong. You can't. Solomon, without the Spirit's anointing in his life, the covenant of God through him and in him, not happening. He found that out. That's what we have in Ecclesiastes. He found out, just like Saul's life, the Spirit of God. This man got in the same place that any believer can get. Not that you can lose your salvation, but you can have broken fellowship with God. So far distant that you just settle for good. Your standard of life is good and it's not for right, because it says in verse number 4 of chapter 2 in 1 Kings, that the Lord may continue his word which he spake concerning me, saying, If thy children take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart, and with all their soul, there shall not fail thee, said he, a man on the throne of Israel. Wow. Oh, that's for King Solomon passed on from David. That's not for us. Oh, really? It's even greater for you and for me. The moment that you get saved, you're a new creature in Christ. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. The Bible then tells me there's no temptation taken us, but such is common to man. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able? But will with the temptation make a way to escape? that she may be able to bear it. That's the new life in Christ. It's a brand new, beautiful, holy life if I so choose to sanctify myself unto God so he sanctifies me. Yes? Agreement? Just do it like this. That's a righteous life. That's the right life. A right life's a whole lot better than a good life. Aren't you tired of just living a good life? Well, say I'm a good person at the end of my life. Everybody say a good person. They'll say it about lost people too. I've been to many funerals of lost people. I've done funerals of lost people. It's heartbreaking to hear people extol the person's life as being so good. There's not one single piece of evidence of righteousness. In Jesus. Think of right. Think of the right. It is definitely better than good. So, here's our devotion today. Here's our Bible time. Go over to Ecclesiastes chapter number 7. Let me walk through these verses in the next 20, 20 20-ish, 25 minutes. Let's have our little Bible study together. Let's see what God has for us and teaches us today as we just kind of break it down. Historical, inspirational, doctrinal. At the end of it, then I'll come together and God has led us for two simple little tie-ins for God's right things. But first we need to really hear what Solomon has to say, the preacher. The preacher's preaching. The preacher's got a message for us. i got to find my spot again here. Where, where is Ecclesiastes? Does anybody know where it is, I need to find it. Okay, here it is. On page 864. Here we go. Right is better than good. Ecclesiastes chapter number 7, verse number 1. Now, come on now. When you, you open up your Bible some mornings, you know you're supposed to be studying something, you just can't find Do you have like that tenor, like sometimes Roger you're going, I know where that passage is and I can't find it. Oh my gosh. And Roger's young. That doesn't hardly even happen. Sometimes, you know, you're looking for something, 
You want to come up here and do it. It's all right. See, here we go. Let's read the first eight verses. This is our first little thought from our chapter today. Verse 1. A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Interesting. Here we go. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting, for that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Pretty heavy and strong verse to make you think. Verse number three. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. I like these better things. Verse 4. The heart of the wise is in the house of the morning, but the heart of, the fool, of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. For the cracking of thorns under a pot, a little fire that's got that wood burning and crackling, it's better for the cracking of the thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. Think about that noise that it's making. It's saying, oh, a person that's a foolish person laughs like that. They sound like a crackling bunch of twigs underneath a pot that is boiling water or something. This is also vanity. Next two verses. Verse number seven, surely your oppression maketh a wise man mad. And a gift destroyeth the heart. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Here's our first one, breaking down those first eight verses. I look, first of all, at better things. Here's some better things. Better. Somebody that has been to any type of funeral usually will hear verse number two. Better to go to the house of mourning. Some people might hear a good name is better than precious ointment, the day of death, than the day of one's birth, and ask them to explain sorrow is better than laughter. And each one of these pieces, you're going, okay, it makes you think a little bit. Makes you think. Better things, I like better. I like better. I like healthier. I like more mature in the Lord. I, I like more sanctification. I like better. Better to go to the house of mourning than even listening to Gary Bikirk's funeral. Gary Bikirk's the man that came to be our special speaker at God Blessed America, Medal of, Want, uh, Medal of Honor uh, awardee. Uh, recipient and he just recently passed away and Pastor George Grace was doing that funeral in Rochester and I was listening to it and he used that verse. Why? Because very simply it causes you to consider life. To consider death. What am I here for? Where did I come from? What is my purpose? Where do I go when I die? What's wrong with those three questions? Those three can get you a conversation at any time, and they come from this premise. You say a good name is better than ointment that is a person's day of death, better than the day of one's birth. Why? Because the day of one's birth, the person gets the name, their name is Mark Brown. What does it mean to anybody? Now, 60-something years later, well, 70 maybe, I don't know. But so many years later, then there's the marker at that grave site, that guy. He's a good guy. I hope that people don't just say that he was a good guy. I hope that people say that he loved the Lord Jesus Christ, that he told people about Jesus, that his life was worth something and it was more eternal than it was temporal. That would be the good name that's better than when you're born because if you die right after a birth, that little baby has a name, but it hasn't lived a life, so you don't know what kind of life. Better it is that there is some mourning, there is some sorrow. It's better for the heart to consider matters that are really important. And that comes from the heart of the wise in the house of the mourning. The heart of fools is in the house of mirth. See, people go to the house of mirth, they party, they have a great time, and they're not considering life, they're not considering anything about life and death and the things that are important. You really think at 7.30 tonight, anybody watching the Chiefs 
game is concerned. Well, I wonder what's going to happen to me if I take my last breath and I die. You're in mirth. For some of you, you're in a higher level of mirth. And then some of you will be sad. Oh, the Chiefs are getting beat. Ah. Hey, don't be clapping. That's bad. <laughs> but here's the deal. The house of mirth is all this happiness and there's not a consideration of the important things. I started considering George, the Lord Jesus Christ when my arm was taken away from me and I could no longer throw a baseball. There wasn't any happiness there. There was no more partying for Mark Brown. I woke up miserable every day because I thought my career was over and God was getting my attention. Very simple. It's better to consider the things that are important. It's a look at the better things. These are things that he is putting out there. Verse number eight, better is the end of thing than the beginning of thereof. Very simply, he's saying, gosh, I love how it starts out, but it's a whole lot better seeing the paint being done these guys had a catastrophe in here Monday. If you saw it in here, you go, oh, my goodness. Who in the world do we hire to do this painting job? Oh, my gosh. But now you look and go, it's better at the end of a thing. Doesn't it look nice? Don't you love this wonderful carpet we have here? Just enjoy it. You've got five, six weeks tops of bringing your coffee in here. After that, argh! New coffee, no more coffee, new carpet, end of February. Ah! Enjoy your coffee in a coffee house. Now there will be nobody in the auditorium for preaching message. <laughs> what have I just done to myself? What am I thinking? <sighs> okay, we'll pass out to everybody one of those cups with the cover on it. Some of you still will be able to. We're going to put black carpeting in. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. Oh, my gosh. You guys are so fun. Next few verses, verse 9. Pick it up with me. We have a lot of ground to cover. Here we go. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry, for anger resteth in the bosom of souls. That's very simple. Be angry and sin not, saith the Lord. Don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Next verse in, in Ephesians says what? Don't give place to the devil. That anger will mess with you. Verse number 10, say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than these? For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning, oh, back in the day, back in the day, golly gee, let it all go. As the old phrase goes, the older we get, the more wonderful we were back there. Sorry, not true. Verse number 11, wisdom is good with an inheritance and by it there is profit to them to see the sun. For wisdom is a defense and money is a defense. But the excellency of knowledge is that wisdom giveth life to them that have it. Great statement. Powerful statement. Verse number 13, he brings God into his statements in preaching message. He's done it just a few times, but he mentions God five different verses in this particular chapter. Verse 13, consider the work of God, for who can make that straight which he hath made crooked? God does what he does. Stop trying to find an answer for God about what he has done, whether it's crooked or straight. God has the answer for it, and he may not break loose with that answer. Consider the work of God. Verse 14, the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider. God also has set the one over against the other to the end that man should find himself, find nothing after him. This very simply is a reason for wisdom. It remains. Wisdom is still important. Solomon, even when he talks about foolishness, being a fool, emptiness, vanity, futility, he still comes back and says, a reason for wisdom remains in these few verses. This is what I see. Wisdom is needful. Wisdom keeps you from wasting your money. Wisdom covers you in a crisis. Wisdom gives you protection. Wisdom from God's ways. Accept it. Accept God's ways. God's sense, like I used last week, makes sense. And God's sense is the only sense that makes sense, even if you don't think it makes sense. Because that's God's wisdom. It's a more peaceable life when you attach yourself to the wisdom of God. May I repeat, it is a much more beautiful and pleasant life when you attach yourself to the wisdom of God. It brings you maturity in difficult times. It brings you humility. 
And it puts you in a place where you're not the know-it-all. We walk around like we think we know everything, then all of a sudden the next week we don't know anything. That just reminds you we really don't know a whole lot. And the older we get, the more we realize we don't have as much wisdom as we thought. And wisdom still is the principal thing. So God says, go after that wisdom. Go after my wisdom. Wisdom still remains important. And by the way, just free of charge, God still is the Mr. Know-it-all. He's the one that knows it all. And when you listen to fools that speak as if they know things, and they know so much, just be reminded that you let them have their way and just say as a foolish person, they sound like that. Say, you know what, you may think you know so much, but God knows. He knows everything. Now I have a series of four two-verse cautions. Follow along with me. Here's the first one, verses 15 and 16. All things have I seen in the days of my vanity. There is a just man that perisheth in his righteousness, and there is a wicked man that prolongeth his life in his wickedness. Be not righteous over much. Neither make thyself overwise. Why shouldest thou destroy thyself? It says up there on the screen, here's a caution for the righteous. Simple. You're righteous in the Lord. You see things that are right. You, you, you're drawn to the righteous things. You like things that are that way. But then you see the wicked and they prosper. They have this wicked life and they continue to just go wicked and wicked and wicked. And they live wickeder and wickeder. This world you live in has wicked people. And you think, oh, they got, I can't believe that God lets them. They're making trillions and trillions of dollars. I cannot believe the stock market. I can't believe this. I can't believe that. And you being the righteous person, here's a caution for you. Watch out what it can do to you to cause you ulcers, to cause you attitude, to cause you an arrogance and a pride over your righteousness instead of God's righteousness in you. Caution for you who wants to be the righteous, proud, and self-righteous. Be careful that you don't take it all on and you're the righteous police. Because righteous without God's wisdom is folly. Who is righteous without Jesus Christ? Would you please name me one? Because there still is none righteous, there's no not one. We are not righteous Because we have this great salvation and we can boast of it, we're righteous in a humble way before Almighty God who saved our souls. Here's a caution for the righteous. Be careful because it could give you a lot of ulcers and end your life early. <laughs> just, just, that's Solomon and that's a good, wise statement. The second caution comes in verses number 17 and 18. Be not overmuch wicked... Neither be thou foolish. Why shouldest thou die before thy time? It is good that thou shouldest take hold of this. Yea, also from this withdraw not thine hand. For he that feareth God shall come forth of them all. Hey, he brings God into this one. Look up on the screen. A caution for the wicked. <laughs> so he cautions the righteous, but now he cautions the wicked. Have somebody in your life that just won't stop living a wicked life. They just won't stop doing the stupid things, the foolish things. You know they're going to end their life. Tragically, they're going to get drunk and they're going to drive and they're going to do something foolish. They're going to hurt somebody else. They're taking prescription drugs. They're doing things. They're hurting their own life. And a caution for the wicked is very simply from Solomon. He's saying, whew. It is good that thou shouldest take hold of this. What? That you are over much wicked you are being foolish you're going to die before thy time but he that feareth God shall come forth of them all you get that person to a place the old phrase is it's hard to have someone come to Jesus Christ for salvation unless they first understand that they're lost that wicked person needs to understand that they're lost that's so important a caution for the wicked, a caution for the righteous. Here's the next two verses, verses 19 and 20. Wisdom strengtheneth the wise more than ten mighty men which are in the city. For there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. Very simple. A caution for the mighty. You know who the mighty are? The ones that are smarter than you. 
bigger than you, stronger than you. They're the ones that have all the money and all the power. And here's the caution for the mighty. Mm-mm. Wisdom strengthen the wise more than ten mighty men which are in the city. The wisdom of God allows you to be wise in the city when those that run the city that are the mighty men, the mighty people, seemingly think they know everything. A caution for the mighty, Solomon saying, watch out. If you don't have wisdom, you're going to get crushed in your own mightiness. You're going to be the person who is the Marvel Avenger, who is the strongest in the room until someone bigger and stronger comes by and takes you out. Seeming there's always someone to do that. But when it comes to wisdom, hey, wisdom, you will be the one that makes those that are ten mighty men Look tiny and small, for there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. That sounds like Paul the Apostle in the book of Romans, doesn't it? And then here's my last caution real quick in verses 21 and 22, and then we'll finish out the chapter. Also take no heed unto all words that are spoken, lest thou hear thy servant curse thee. For often... Times also thine own heart knoweth that thou thyself likewise hast cursed others. A caution for the sensitive. I wonder if they're talking about me. I wonder if somebody says something bad about me. I thought I heard my name spoken out in the lobby. I wonder what they said. Watch out. Be careful. You may hear something about you that's been spoken, and if you become sensitive, woo, he's saying watch out for all the words that may be spoken against you. And then he says in warning in verse number 22 that you may be one that curses others similarly as someone is cursing your name. Old Charles, Charles Spurgeon said this to his pastor students that were learning what it meant to be a minister in their future in ministry, he said, you need to have one blind eye and one deaf ear. This is what he says. You cannot stop people's tongues, he said, and therefore the best thing to do is to stop your own ears and never mind what is spoken. There is a world of idle chit-chat abroad, and he who takes note of it will have enough to do. That comes from lectures to my students by Spurgeon. A caution for the sensitive. Don't be so sensitive. As I've told you before, I'd like to believe that everybody loves me and says nice things. Thank you very much. You're all so kind. (laughs) Last thought, we'll cover verses 23 through 29 in our little chapter devotion this morning in church. Here we go. Verse number 23. All this have I proved by wisdom. I said I will be wise, but it was far from me. (laughs) Solomon, ha, I'll be wise. What happened to his wisdom? He doesn't sound like he's wise here. He's admitting it now. Verse 24. That which is far off And exceeding deep, who can find it? Now Solomon is asking some tough questions here about himself and of himself and of life. Verse 25 is kind of a same text as our theme verse, Ecclesiastes 1.13. I applied mine heart to know, to search, to seek out wisdom, and the reason of things, and to know the wickedness of folly, even of foolishness and madness. That's still a, a, a good task, but that task from God. It can be quite a trial, he says. Now look at his conclusions in verse 26, 7, 8, and 9. These are good because they're really transparent. This is a man being very transparent about his life at this point. He says in verse 26, and I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands Whoso pleaseth God shall escape from her, but the sinner 
shall be taken by her. Great statement in reference to what God can do. Verse 27. Behold, this have I found, saith the preacher, counting one by one to find out the account, which ye yet my soul seeketh, but I find not. One man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all those have I not found. How many women did Solomon have in his life? A thousand. Verse 29. Lo, this only have I found, that God hath made man upright. That's the beginning of us. But they have sought out many inventions. Up on the screen it says this. This is just simply a testimony of backsliding. Let me just, for a minute, just have you think for a moment. And as you write down your notes and you get things pulled together in your thought, I want to have you just kind of think about this testimony of backsliding. You can also turn to 1 Kings 9 if you want. I'll be there to finish out our message. There have been times in each one of your lives, guaranteed, it, it, it's a hundred, it's got to be a hundred out of a hundred, where somebody has said, hey, can I sit down and talk to you? I have something I want to share with you. It might be probably an older person talking to a younger. It might be a dad or a mom with a child. It might be a grandparent. It might be a, a discipler in another person's life, a, someone who's in a disciple-making relationship with someone. They're sitting down with a disciple. It, Maybe just simply like Jesus Christ in John 13, 14, 15, 16, sitting down with the apostles. And he's saying, can I give you some advice? Can I tell you what life can be like one way or the other? Here's what Solomon's doing right here in just these last few verses. He's saying to you and me this. And now we start unveiling what happened to this man. I mean deeply. We know the accounting in 1 Kings 11. We'll finish up in that down the road here in our finishing of our series soon. The women turned his heart. But how did he get to the place where he even considered them? He's telling you right here. I was a man of wisdom and yet I'm no longer wise. I'm a man who's looking for the meaning of my life and that it's a deeper thing. And yet, to search and to seek out and look for God and to say, this is the way it ought to be, I went after the wrong things. Very simply, he's a man of wisdom who's experienced backsliding. And he's saying, don't do this, don't do this, and don't do this. And it's like telling your four-year-old grandchild, don't put your finger in that light socket. It's like, they think, I guess I need to figure out if grandpa's right. <laughs> this is serious. Believers, this testimony of backsliding is so relevant to every one of us. And he's saying here, the reason of things, to know the wickedness of folly, even the foolishness and madness, I find more bitter than death. The woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands is bands. <coughs> Who pleases God shall escape from her. Obviously, he didn't please God. But the sinner shall be taken by her. If you think you're stronger than the sin of this world or the sin of your flesh, you are crazy. If you think you can beat the devil, you're crazy. If you think you can make yourself susceptible and available to the wisdom of this world and think that right is not better than good and you live your life in a place where good, 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 I just live a good life, just live a good life, what will that look like at the judgment seat of Christ? What will that really look like? Let no one to the Lord. I've got no gold, no silver, no precious stones. I never really put my life to the matter of just serving Jesus Christ. I don't even know God's right thing. But I've come to church, I've given my tithe, I've done all that I can, and I've settled on being good. I hate to have someone at the end of my life say, yeah, he was a good guy. So 
So here's two things very simply from 1 Kings chapter number 9 that will help you grab a handle on how Solomon again started well and how so many of us start well but end up in a place of Ecclesiastes. Let's turn this thing around a little bit. Let's not let this continue to go in a place where good is okay and good is okay and good is okay. Right is better than good. Life doesn't always make sense, and that's fine, but God's sense does make sense. Good things can become bad, so let's become more spiritually aware of what we're really in the middle of here. Because it's serious, and God is very serious, and I'm very serious here in the Spirit with Solomon, looking at him and going, who am I? Who am I that could not fall into this place? This Solomon fell into. Our first God's right thing is this. On the screen. Succumb to the seriousness of God's will in a matter. Think of the matter that's before you right now. I want you to think about a matter. And I want you to think about how you need to succumb to the seriousness of God's will. What does it mean to succumb to something? To yield to superior strength or force or overpowering appeal or desire. Succumb to. Are you going to succumb to the temptation or are you going to succumb to God's will? Because it says there, do not succumb to the temptation of your will in that matter. Think of whatever the matter is that you're in right now. You need to succumb to the seriousness of God's will in a matter. How do I know that? There's so many different accountings, but since we're studying the life of Solomon a bit... While we're studying the book of Ecclesiastes, look at the first five verses of 1 Kings chapter number 9. Chapter number 9, 1 Kings, I've got the address up there. You're just going to have to follow along. I do not have the verses. Here we go. And it came to pass when Solomon had finished the building of the house of the Lord, the king's house, and all Solomon's desire, which he was pleased to do, that the Lord appeared to Solomon the second time as he had appeared unto him at Gibeon. Remember, we've referenced this passage and we looked at an introduction to this man named Solomon, the king, who had God appear to him twice. Not once, twice. Pretty powerful. And this is what happened at the second time that Solomon had the Lord appear. Verse 3. The Lord said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and thy supplication that thou hast made before me. I have hollowed out this house. This is all referencing what he just did in 1 Kings chapter number 8 that we covered last week. Which thou hast built to put my name there forever. And mine eyes and mine heart shall be there perpetually. God says, I'm all in with you, Solomon, and the nation of Israel. And if, verse 4, thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked in the integrity of heart and the uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee, and will keep my statutes and my judgments, then I will establish the throne of my kingdom upon Israel forever, as I promised to David thy father, saying, there shall not fail thee a man upon the throne of Israel. We read that to start our message in 1 Kings chapter number 2, by the way. David said it to him. Succumb to the seriousness of God's will in a matter. God's will was just laid out for you in five verses. Why did you use that verse, Pastor? Because the Holy Spirit of God led me here. It's clear what the Lord's will is for Solomon and for the nation of Israel. He prayed it, he dedicated it, he worshiped, he gave sacrifice, he did all that in chapter number 8. And now he's there and the Lord appears to Solomon, visits with him and says, here's my will for you. Worship, word, walk. Sound familiar? It's all right there. It's all right there. We need to succumb to the seriousness of God's will in a matter, not the temptation of our own will. Again, there's no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. If you think, (laughs) mm -mm. we need to stay close to the will of God and choose the will of God in the midst of a matter because the matter is right before us. Will I choose the will of God? Here's God's second right thing, and I'll be done. God's right thing also means this. You and I need to listen to the severity of God's warning in a decision. God has warnings. God's very serious. 
This is not man speaking. This is God speaking. Verses 5 through 9 here in a moment. Listen to the severity of God's warning in a decision. Not the impulsivity of your whims in the moment. Well, I felt like, and I wondered like, and la da 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 I felt like I should. That felt like you should will get you in an awful lot of trouble. Well, I was kind of feeling like I could have maybe possibly, whoa, have we gotten ourselves in trouble on the impulsivity of our whims in the moment. How do you know if it's God or not? Have you been praying about it? Is it in the word of God? Does it go against his will? Or is it right in line with his will? Listen to the severity of God's warnings and a decision. Don't listen to your little, well, the little guy on my shoulder told me it was going to be all right. Really? Well, I felt it right underneath my liver and my kidneys. Yeah. Yeah, watch out for the warning. Here it is, because Solomon fell into that. Here's his warning, and I'm done. 1 Kings chapter number 9, verses 6 through 9. Here we go. Isn't it beautiful how the Word of God gives us what we need? But if, there it is, verse 6, don't have to read any further, but let's go. But if ye shall at all turn from following me, ye or your children, and will not keep my commandments and my statutes, what I have set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them. And this house, which I have hollowed for my name, will I cast out of my sight, and then Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all people. And at this house, which is high, everyone that passeth by shall be astonished and shall hiss. And they shall say, Why hath the Lord done thus unto this land and to this house? And they shall answer, Because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought forth their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and have taken hold upon other gods, and have worshipped them and served them. Therefore hath the Lord brought upon them all this evil. (sighs) Listen to the severity of God's warning in a decision, not the impulsivity of your whims in the moment. Succumb to his will, listen to the severity of God's warnings. So we finish with just this simple thought. The choice to do what is right over what is good is generated by the righteousness of God. It is. I mean, you and I, we we can think we know what's right, and for the most part, if you're a believer who's been discipled, someone will show you the word of God, they're saying, hey, I know what's right in the matter. But your walk may erode a little bit like Solomon's, and now you're going, I don't know if this is right or wrong. I don't know if I should do it or not. And God's saying, the good is okay, but the righteousness of God will take me through. So is today the day you admit that God's right thing is better than your good thing? Is today the day that you admit and I admit that God's right thing is better than your good thing. Please bow for a word of prayer. As our music plays and our invitation time starts, our time of prayer, let me pray for you. Our Father in heaven, thank you for your beautiful word again. As I often pray and I'm continually reminded Only your word in the name of Jesus can do the work that it does by your Holy Spirit. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for the people of God here listening online or very simply just being here in person. I pray for your spirit to work in our hearts, work in everybody's hearts. And in this time of invitation, people will really consider the question, is today the day to admit that your right way is better than our good way in Jesus name please stand please stand please respond as God would have you to respond our altar is here you can come the music is